Hello my fellow Extraordinary Americans, I'm Cosmo Zdar and this is Extraordinary America. What is Extraordinary America about? You see, American identity is about freedom, the opportunity for a better life and the pursuit of happiness. However, most Americans are not free when it comes to the financial front. Most Americans are suffering from financial slavery due to loss of jobs, stagnant wages, inflation and debt of all kinds. Wealth and income inequality runs rampant across America and the middle class is all but disappeared. So what is Extraordinary America about? Extraordinary America is about the abolition of financial slavery. It is about the financial freedom of the 99%. It is about the nation of immigrants and descendants of immigrants awakening and unleashing the extraordinary within themselves and setting themselves free. The path to financial freedom is through entrepreneurship and investing on the light side. It is about financial education, not only when it comes to money in the monetary systems, but also in regards to how to start a business, investing, especially when it comes to precious metals and real estate. In this podcast, I interview guests, many of whom came from humble beginnings, to see how they did it and how they attained financial freedom in their own lives and how they did business. And it is my hope that you will be inspired and you will want to awaken extraordinary within yourselves and realize the American dream. Once again, welcome to Extraordinary America. I'm glad to have her on the show. Anne, are you there? I am. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Great to be here with you today. Uh, uh, great. It's great to have you over here as well, Ad. So, Ad, can you tell me and the audience a little bit more about yourself, uh, your background, and how you got started? Look, absolutely. It's it's a long, long, um, or different aspects, but what I'll do is I'll try and be concise. If I look back to uh, how I grew up, I can really see that um, my parents and the way they nurtured me and brought me up, even though they were not entrepreneurs themselves, they developed in me the skills and abilities that I am now continuing to use today within my various businesses and over the years that I've had. And if I go right back to when I was quite young, uh, my parents never believed in just giving me pocket money. They brought me up to realize that there should be a fair exchange in, um, you know, money versus what I did for my money. So I grew up with multiple streams of income, even when I was a young teenager, and it really built in me this not any desire to look for ways in which I could contribute, uh, not expertise in that instance, because when I was a kid or a teenager, I certainly didn't have expertise, but I had the skills and ability and um, the multiple income streams I had because I lived on a farm and I needed to fund my horses. So in order to do that, horses are very expensive. So what I did was I collected manure and that was quite a successful business. I I babysat, I cleaned houses, I fed animals, uh, lots of different things. The very first business venture actually, and I say that with inverted commas, you know, air commas, was selling tadpoles, uh, you know, on the side of the the road. But in that, it it developed in me the ability to to want to see how can I fix things? How can I contribute things? how, How can I help others? And in the same token, provide this fair, an equitable exchange of in those you know skills or support so that I could then fund my um, fund my different hobbies and, and things like that then fast forward I was in the career industry for quite some time obviously as, as a career I was uh, office manager and had some solid background in um, admin and bookkeeping and accounting and so forth. And that really held me in good stead to when I started a family was had, you know, a number of, of young kids then at a time and I, at the time, and I thought I would really love to start doing something. I mean, I loved motherhood, but I always felt there was more, you know, so my husband bought me a computer and said, do you think you could do anything with that? And that was back on the day. Just let me say, I, 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 I am in my fifties now. So that was back in the day when computers were out for a while, but they certainly not technology was certainly not um, as it is today. And we were only just starting to get the internet. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, okay, I can learn. And I can, I mean, I've used a computer when I was at work and from there, it just continued to evolve. I always learn learning, always developing. Um, and, you know, with the advent of of internet and the people that I met, I'm based in Australia, but I met a lot of people and colleagues over in the US and the things they were doing, it was just incredible, the amount of information that we had um, available 
to us. And so what I did when I started to do home study again, because I had children, I started to uh, study in the area of careers and then HR, human resources. And then I got really interested in, well, m- what makes people tick? So I started to do more ar- around, you know, p- HR and people in the work in- environment and why people were unhappy in their work. And I developed a career consultancy, which then continued uh, on to working with entrepreneurs in the area of personal branding, finding careers that they loved and then positioning positioning themselves in the marketplace. Um, and it just continued to evolve and, and grow. I mean, I'm one of those people, and I'm sure you talk to many of them on your podcast. We don't sit still. There's always, a, you know, something new to learn, a new piece of technology. How can I leverage that? We love challenges and sitting around just doing the same old, same old does just does not motivate it and inspire. And uh, so for me, it has been a lot of learning and then sharing what I've learned, but particularly all of the mistakes I've made. And I've made so many because I'm often trying out new things, as I'm sure so many of your guests are, but then figuring out how to do what things in a certain way and then teaching and showing others. That's what I love to do too, so that they don't make the same mistake or if they find themselves in a certain scenario that they've got the skills and abilities and the mindset to be able to shift through that. So, And now, of course, that's tra- transitioned into personal branding and marketing more in the set of skills used with entrepreneurs and business owners, particularly coaches and consultants, service-based businesses who are selling their expertise and knowledge versus, you know, a a lot of physical products. And that's a whole different skill set and mindset that we need to be mindful of, you know, charging what we're worth, the value we offer people, which is often intangible because it's knowledge. And um, and so then helping them to create that message, identifying their unique and uncopyable and when I say unforgettable aspects of themselves. And then for those who want to continue on with a podcast, we help them launch that as well. But it's been absolutely fun. I'll never stop learning. There's always new things to, to implement and integrate. Um, and that's just part of, you know, the fun of being an entrepreneur and, and uh, your own business because, you know, you're, you're limited to your own expectations and limitations. No, I mean, totally like the way, the way you were from like the beginning, like where you were in the farm and then to where you're now, it's very, it's very fascinating because a lot of people, like you could put them in the same position, they would think differently and then they would have different results in their life. So, and my question to you would be, what was your strategic vision from the time you were in the farm and you started doing all these different streams of income and like, how did it evolve over the course of your life and career to like where, to where you're now, or was it, was it one? One constant vision or was there like an evolution from your, from your perspective? That's such a great question. I'm great, glad you asked that because when I think back to when I was on the farm and it, I didn't have a vision of entrepreneurship, what really at that time, what was driving me forward was there were things that I needed uh, to fund and, you know, my parents kind of said, well, go and you've got a lot of opportunities there to find the opportunities. But I always had in the back of my mind as I was continuing my schooling to become a teacher. Uh, I am adopted and I had found out from a very young age that my biological parents were teachers and the family, the lovely, loving family that I was adopted into were also teachers, ranging from a kindergarten teacher right up to professor uh, in a theological college. And so I was surrounded, you know, with teachers and I always had the passion and desire to teach. And so when I was the age of 15, still going to high school, back then we called it high school in New Zealand, where I was born, um, I had an accident. I fell off one of my horses and uh, during a riding session and I was concussed. And so I ended up losing my memory. And back then the study of neuroscience was very new. And so um, I found myself falling asleep at, you know, in school, I had multiple headaches all of the time. And um, long story short, I ended up um, 
considering going back and doing repeating the year. But my parents said to me, look, uh, if you continue night school, why don't you go and get a, a job and then go back to night school and then we can do catch up. That never ended up eventuating because I found myself um, in a role working in an office and I just excelled in that particular area and I continued to, to do night school and that subsequently led me to get into the HR and, and accounting and so forth. But why I share that is because I'd always, from a very young age, you know, teenage years, and even when I started my family, had always thought if I'd never had that accident, what would my life look like? Would it be different? And then I realized as I continued to do my studies in the area of career counseling and career coaching and going through a lot of certifications that I used with my clients, I had to use those on myself to find down you know, a self-discovery, self-awareness, what were my motivational skills, you know, what were my strengths, all of those things I needed to learn about myself as I did my certifications to be able to use those different assessments and tools with my clients. And I realized that I, even though I had an accident, that career path and that different path actually had led me down the right path because I learned that I was an extroverted introvert. And had I become a teacher, you are full on all the time with children, no matter what age, whether they're youngsters or teenagers, you're on all the time interacting. I would have burnt out because I need time on my own. I, I know that I need time to um, rest and recuperate. Yes, I enjoy meeting and interacting with people, but I need significant periods of time on my own, out of nature, uh, just resting, not talking. Otherwise, I would burn out. And so I realized that. And I also realized that I was able to leverage the passion of teaching and nurturing others in their development and whatever areas that they needed to learn. And I was doing that as part of my work. And so when you ask me, did you have that vision? I did have a vision around teaching and empowering and nurturing, but it just ended up being a lot different to what I thought it would be. And I'm so glad it is because had I continued to become a teacher the way that I thought I would, uh, I probably would have been very unhappy in that role. It, it's interesting, Anne, like how there's like these different events that happen in our lives where it seems uh, it seems like at that time, like it just seems like an incident. But uh, when you look back in hindsight, it just changes the, it, like it just changed the entire course of your life or your destiny. Yeah. And it's funny how many times that happens, like we're going in a certain direction, but then something happens and then we we our life takes a pivot and then uh, and then it just happens just like that, you know. And so we never. I can... have uh, so many pivots. That that particular accident uh, led me, as I mentioned, to go uh, on to do night school, and then I also did. Um, I ended up going to one of our local hospitals because they had a concussion clinic, and through that concussion clinic, they had devised um, a system of therapy if you will, to help people who had gone undergone concussion and looking at the way the brain was working with concussion and how can we um, enhance their memory again. So for six months, I would go there quite regularly, I think three times a week. But then also as part of that, alongside, I did some studies and through that, those studies where the place that I went, I met and, and befriended um, someone who's become a dear friend of mine and she moved to Australia and then I followed her several years after that and um, I subsequently then met my husband who was her uncle. So had that accident not happened, I would never have come to Australia, would never have, well, and I say never, I mean, there might have been another path that led me there. But that accident, as you said, was a significant um, pivot, not only in my career, but also in uh, my family life now, because I, I ended up meeting the man that uh, is now my husband of 30 something years. So yeah, it might never have occurred. And like sometimes like there are certain bad things that happen in our life. And then when we look back, it turns out what it turns out to be one of the greatest things ever. But like it's only in hindsight that we look at that and we basically see uh, that so-called really bad thing or terrible thing that happened. And I'm telling this for the audience's sake as well. Like there's things that happen in our life where we cannot explain 
why why this thing is happening or it's like a terrible thing at the moment but then when you look years back like years like years later you look back and, and look at it in hindsight you realize all these lessons that you learned then and how your life became better as a result but at that time it'll feel terrible you know but speaking of speaking of like bad things like I know in the bio I talked about we talked about like a significant business setback that you've had and that altered the course of your uh, of like the way you did business and everything. Can you tell me in the audience a little bit more about that and what you did yes. to overcome that? Yeah, absolutely. So throughout my business career, I mentioned to you that I tried a number of different things, as we all do. We're risk takers. And there were things that didn't turn out quite as we had hoped. But we just keep getting up and we try different ways. We tweak things. Um, but what what often happens, and this is what I learned as well, um, was that, you know, through my um, studies and, and uh, mindset studies and things that I did, what ended up happening was back in 2015, 16, I developed a, a partnership and that partnership had been developed over 18 months and we'd built some incredible products. We were working with some incredible clients and really we had built a seven figure pipeline of business and opportunities, but unfortunately that came to a screaming halt and we just lost everything. I won't go into the details of why, I contributed to all of those things. So, you know, it's a, another opportunity, as I mentioned, to really do some soul searching. And that's what I ended up doing because through that experience, what will, can often happen is, and again, this is what I learned in my studies, when a significant emotional event happens and it is so significantly emotional and you've had other experiences that are similar and they may not necessarily have to be so intense, but what ends up happening is all of those situations bound together or bind together, if I can use that term, and it really just hits you for a six. I don't know if you've got that saying um, in the US. And that did for me too. And I realized looking back that I was burnt out. Uh, I could not, as a creator, I love creating things. I mean, often one of my challenges is turning off my brain, which I'm sure so many other entrepreneurs um, have the issue too. We're always thinking about new things. And sometimes it's it can be a little bit like, ah, oh, can I just sit? But anyway, I could not create, could not uh, write. And I thought, you know what, if this situation, if I don't work through this, if I don't heal through this, because I felt very betrayed at the time and there was a lot of, you know, negative emotions around that. And I thought if I don't heal with this and deal with this, it had the ability to change the very core of who I was, some of my core values, such as trust. Trust for me is so important. Integrity is so important for me as well. And so many Many people who were in my circle were telling me, you're too trusting. You shouldn't have trusted me. You should have done this. You should have done that. But I like to treat people in the way in which I would want them, you know, to respond and how I would want to show up. And I did not want to go through life being jaded and skeptical about people. There's a difference between being so skeptical and jaded versus being discerning and being, you know, being, um, having risk, but um, planned risk, if, if, you know, there's certain things that we can do to mitigate that. And so I knew that if I didn't deal with that, I would turn out to be a very jaded, unhappy person who would probably be triggered uh, anytime anything similar happened. Because one of the other things that I learned through the studies and wonderful mentors that I've had over my lifetime is that there is a thing that is called goal trauma. So that's goal trauma and financial trauma. And if I didn't heal from both that financial trauma and the goal trauma of setting goals, but being so hesitant to even try to go forward because I'm thinking, what if it failed? What if I fail again? What if I put my trust in others and they let me down again? I knew that if I didn't deal with that, um, I would just have this cycle, continuous cycle. So I spent a lot of time dealing with that, healing through that, I think I might have mentioned to you when we spoke uh, privately, uh, I'm a Christian. So I spent a lot of time in prayer, a lot of time in the Bible, and uh, uh, that really helped me as well personally. And I was able to deal through that. But there were some other things, not just the mindset things that I dealt with. There were some practical things that I dealt with. And I realized that I really needed to 
set a vision and a mission because how I had done business before was, oh, I want to do that project. I'm going to dive full in. And then as soon as we get, I get bored, oh, I'm going to do this. And I was all over the place. So I took a good four to five months working with this wonderful group of entrepreneurs and, and mentors to really look at, well, what, what, who am I? What, what, where is my life going? What do I want for my business and the impact and influence that I want to make uh, out in the world and for others? How can I contribute, you know, with my gifts and talents? Uh, and so I spent four months really devising that. And so that would have been back in around 2017. And my vision and my mission has stayed the same, which is to impact the world one message at a time, one podcast at a time to be that difference. One message, one podcast at a time being that difference. What has changed are the different strategies, the different techniques, the different, um, you know, projects that I might participate in, but it's always been heading in that one direction. And I have found that, um, uh, that mission and vision has been so important and, you know, making sure that I consistently work on certain projects. And when things do get uh, a little bit monotonous to make sure I've got team behind me so that they do, the, the people mm -hmm. who love to just continue to do the same old same each, each day, because that's so important as well, which frees me up to do the things that I know that I, that light me up and uh, that are really in my gift, gift set and my wheelhouse. And so there were many lessons that I learned, but one in particular that I want to share from that, from the other things that I have just shared, I launched Women in Leadership podcast because as I mentioned to you, I thought, you know, I can't create anything. Um, I can't write, but what I can do is I can ask questions. So my goal with Women in Leadership podcast was to surround myself with incredible women, women who were leaders, women who who had overcome challenges, overcome failure. And I thought, I'm just going to learn from them and immerse myself into uh, just being around them. And none of them early on knew that I had started Women in Leadership podcast with really a selfish, if I can use that term, it wasn't really, but it, it was to try and help me get over my loss and my grieving through learning from them. And an interesting thing happened. Uh, three episodes in, I accidentally generated two four-figure clients. And these were two women. One was a doctor uh, and another was a des designer. She was an architect, so building designer. And they both needed support in their branding, their positioning and their managing uh, uh, managing of their you know marketing and so forth. And I say accidentally generated these two four-figure clients because prior to uh, Women in Leadership podcast, I'd had a number of podcasts which had followed a podcast that I launched back in 2008 when I was still working in the career industry. And we had a podcast, Career Success Radio, for two years, and we struggled to really monetize that. The podcasting space was quite new at that stage, but there was a lot of things that I was now able to reflect on through how I launched Women in Leadership podcast and what was in place and what needed to be in place versus what was not in place when we looked at, you know, launching and continuing to publish Career Success Radio. And then I realized, oh, I had, th these are the things that I had in place. And that enabled these two women who had no idea who I was to do a Google search for a brand consultant, stumble across my website, have a look around, listen to the three episodes, and then decide, you know what? We want to work with Anne-Marie. Let's give her a call and see what the best way to do that was. And so that led me then on a journey to not only be able to identify the steps that needed to be in place, but also how can I now teach that and share that with others and create the business systems and the models that others can then implement and do for themselves. And that's what led me on the journey to write um, Invisible to Influential Trusted Authority with a podcast uh, and 
also my program Podcasting with Purpose, which is a 90-day idea to launch, but really looking at message and monetization from a trusted authority position, you know, um, why does someone become the choice versus just, you know, other choices of you know that stage and still today, there's so many other personal brand strategists. What was it that made these two women want to come and, and work with me? And that's what I continue to teach in, in my programs. But that was on the back of starting Women in Leadership podcast because of my failure and my wanting to start something to help me get over my uh, my grief and loss. And not only did it enable me to do that, it's enabled me to create now a whole body of teaching, which I can share now with others. Because I think failure, whatever whatever uh, instance or how severe it may be, um, how we look at it, how we address it and how we move through that and move on from that is going to determine, you know, just how, how far we can progress. And a lot of it has to do around mindset. Well, and this is like a, it's like a tremendous comeback, but one of the things that comes to mind is like definitely like the trust factor, right? Like a lot of people that are, they want to do business, they're actually very sketchy about like how to find the ideal business partner, right? Because uh, like, like what are like the red flags? How do you know when somebody, uh, like how can you trust somebody? And like, how do you go about doing that? Like, do you think that there's a process to go about finding like a, part like partner in business uh, with regards to like character traits or like, is there like any red flags or is that just something we have to use our intuition or how just faith in God or something of like that? Well, I think there's a lot of different aspects of all of those different areas that you've identified, but some of the things that were very, very uh, um, apparent to me or became apparent to me were, were the red flags that I could see and others had questioned me about. And I basically just wrote them off by saying, it'll be all right, it'll be fine. Um, because I really naturally assumed it, it was fine. So, and we know that this is so important and I'm sure we've all got accountants and lawyers um, who we have got in our network of a circle of network or network of circles, I should say. And they are, are so correct in saying how you establish that relationship is so very important. So whether you have a formal agreement or contracts or memorandum of understanding, that would have been just so very important important too. Looking at the different skill sets and having documented what are the expectations. We didn't have any of that. And so for me, I found that I was putting 110% into to the relationship where the other person um, had other as aspects as well. And that was fine, but that should have at least been documented then. Um, and just how we set up the business as far as taking in the money and then who was responsible and who had access and all of those different things, how we deal with relationships with our clients. We didn't have those product protocols in place and they just are so important. You've got to do some preliminary risk management, even though we don't tend to like to want to do that, you know, what happens or what, how do we address this? Uh, if that's not in place, Things that then should be addressed straight away tend not to be addressed because we're a bit, bit a little bit embarrassed or, you know, we don't want to bring that up. And so looking back, that is really very important. Something else that I'll mention as well, and this is to do with maybe not necessarily my business partnership, but a lot of people I see do co-hosting for podcasts. And the reason that they do that is because they may not necessarily want to do a podcast on their own. So having a voice there who is able to bounce off one another, you know, you're able to create, um, yeah, that camaraderie and, and have someone else to be able to speak when you might've run out of something to say and navigating interview questions and so forth. And I realized looking back with Career Success Radio with my co-host who we just got on so well and he had the gift of the gab and, and I was learning, you know, just at that stage, I had no idea even to ask questions and things like that. So I learned a lot from him as well. But if you have a look at, say, a business model, and now what I teach is you've got to look at who are your ideal clients and look at it from end to end. When someone is just coming to get to know, like, and trust you, right through the customer journey from getting off the podcast and onto your list, 
through the customer journey that you continue to create as part of your list and nurturing and all of that, building reputation, right through to having conversations with someone and whether that conversation is a sale because they're a great client and a great fit and, you know, they're ready to make that move or or not. Maybe they're not just quite ready. So when I looked at my co-host, his business structure was very different. His ideal client was very different. And so um, I could see that the audience that we were attracting on Career Success Radio weren't, were, were, there was too diverse, far diverse. And we assumed that our listeners would just really love the content that we shared, find it so valuable that they would go off and do as much research as they could about us. But it could, life and you know, people get busy and that doesn't necessarily happen. And that was back in 2008 to 2010. Now, of course, there are far more podcasts, far more noise, far more social media tools. So it's so important. It's integral that you have, you know, your, your customer journey, your funnel and all of the nurturing sequences that you have in place, the touch points um, are are. are cohesive and are consistent in the message that you are sharing. But again, when you're talking about partnerships, a co-hosted podcast may not necessarily be the best if you're not working in the same business and therefore both of you have the same vision and goal, but ultimately the outcome of your podcast is aligned as well because at the end of the day, there's one business and, and one offering that you are leading people to. And I find a lot of co-hosted podcasts don't necessarily think of that. So hopefully what I've shared there shares some some insights into a number of those areas to consider when looking at uh, partnering and co-hosting and so forth. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it does. And I would just like to add that, like with regards to red flags, like if you notice somebody that's more like narcissistic or has like more of like egotism and there's like, there's like an initial stage of like just, really a career there's like that arrow like that feel of charisma right and then you're just yeah. drawn in and uh it just there's like this element where you feel like it's kind of on a superficial level i don't know for me i i realized to like just stay away from those kind of people because uh, yeah. uh if it's too good to be true it usually tends to be you know yeah, absolutely. One of the things with the partnership that I developed in the in the business, uh, one of the areas that we'd identified was there was a certain set of skills that I had versus set of skills that she had. And they were very different, but complementary. And I think what you're talking about there is around someone's attitude. Absolutely. It is so important as to what attitude they have. But, you know, um, and why I share that too, is that sometimes people who have um, complementary uh, skill set is really important. And and also, how do I say this? You know, sometimes when we get similar people on the same team, it is good to have people who are able to approach things differently. So attitude has to be so important. But I think having someone with a different approach to you is going to give you an all-rounded view of how to approach things. For instance, um, I, even though I love, you know, talking on a microphone, you turn a microphone on, fantastic. But for me to ring up people out of the blue and say, hi, you know, sharing, being vulnerable here, to me, I have to walk around, pace myself and go, bring up that person because I'm, as I said, an extroverted introvert. But for, for my colleague at the time, she loved that. She loved going to networking events. For me, I would have loved to just stay in my office, working on different things, having interviews like this and, um, you know, sharing content, developing content. And so I think sometimes the, the approach uh, can be different um, and, and different skill sets are important too, because then you can complement one another or if someone or your business partner can see that there's a particular area that um, they can call you out on it you know if, if, if I can say it that way so that's important I think too because otherwise you might have people that um, are surrounding you that all think the same and then you don't necessarily see some of the potential gaps that could be there but I too do agree with you as far as the attitude and and who they are and um You've got to be on the same page in that, you know, core values. I think that really um, boils down to how, you know, what is the attitude and, and how do they approach certain things? And if it's not aligned, if the vision and the mission and how you're going to achieve that is not aligned, then it's going to be very different, you know, or difficult to achieve that for sure. 
No, I mean, yeah, like I think morality, like knowing whether the other person has morals, ethics and values plays a huge role. And sometimes it might take time. And also they, there's a way of understanding it through patterns, right? Like we observe like patterns and behaviors. Like if somebody is more, for instance, like in my in my own observance, if I notice that somebody is very materialistic and has like watches and this and that, I know automatically this person is superficial and I cannot, I just, I'm not going to trust this person. But if, if I see that somebody, and then there's also like on the other side, there's like people that are super religious, but like there's a sense of like religious hypocrisy. Like I don't trust those people, but if somebody is generally spiritual in their practical actions, you see them being generous and then they're giving and they have empathy and they have these traits. And for me, like the, and I see that in their everyday life, I know I can trust them when it comes to like being like a partner or anything like like i know skill set is important but you also have to take into account the personality traits as well and there are these patterns and we can get into it if, if i were to get into it like it'll take like an hour another hour but you notice these <laughs> yeah. things you know like the like if somebody's egotistical oh red flag like it, it yeah. just it, it just shows like somebody's super materialistic super hedonistic red flag because it's just like a pattern, like the more it's somehow associated with self-centeredness and yes. like spiritual values. I'm not talking about religious hypocrisy. I'm talking about actual spiritual values. Like they tend to be like more uh, long lasting and just like everything. But and yeah. I had I had to ask you a question regarding your mindset around challenges and facing challenges in life and setbacks in life because I think this is really important for the audience. Like, what is your what is your like when you have a challenge in your life? How do you perceive it, and uh, mm -hmm. and what is the reasoning behind it? Yeah, well, when I typically have challenges, um, I do quite enjoy challenges, and that might sound really strange. I'm not talking about so being so overwhelmed that um, because we know that an overwhelmed or a confused mind does nothing, but having something that you need to problem solve. And I think that is a skill that a lot of entrepreneurs, and by the way, intrapreneurs um, have that as well. And I, I think the difference between intrapreneurs and entrepreneurs is that an intrapreneur has similar skills and giftings that the entrepreneur has, but they don't necessarily want to run their own business. An intrapreneur is fantastic within a corporate space because they are able to solve problems. They are able to look for new ways of doing things. You know, why do we do things the same old, same old when we can save time, money, and, and you know, all of that. So entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, whereas the entrepreneur likes to, to, to use a lot of those skills and gifts within their own business, their own entity. And so when I look at a challenge, even when I was in the workplace and even when I was young, it's like, well, how, how do we get over this? What can I do? What do I know already? What's available to me? Who do, who else do I know that has been through a certain problem? What can I learn from them? And I just love sorting that out. Um, you know, if I think back to some of the major issues, even in the workplace, I remember when I left work, we just, this is my, the, my full-time career, had having a, a child, we just implemented a brand new accounting software package. And um, this is before I left. And there was something that was just not working in the software package. And it was something to do with the programming and the company who developed that software package couldn't figure it out. And I have always loved the kind of that forensic accounting. I had uh, in my lifetime, when I was working in my career, had discovered for two businesses um, uh, people who had stolen from the company when I had gone through their book work, I realized, hang on a minute, there's fraudulent activity here. And when I followed the thread there, in one case, there was tens of thousands of dollars that had been fraudulently stolen from the company. So I, I and that's the challenges too. When I noted something that's not quite right, I will follow that thread and, and love to identify what, you know, what's not working, what's going on here. And so I spent ages, I can't remember exactly what I did, but I, I looked at all of the different figures for the software package. And I realized that when a certain transaction had been done, there was something in the programming that didn't work. And that then allowed the developers to create 
uh, a patch or whatever it is they they call it and the the software was able to be you know uh, to, to work and when I left my employment that company actually approached me and said would you come and be one of our consultants. They were just so impressed and so very thankful that I'd help them. Um, but so uh, it, throughout my career, I've always loved what's issues, what are challenges, what's not, what doesn't look right. And I will follow that through. And, and that's what gives me motivation. I just love that. And so um, when you think of different challenges, like when you hear, you know, when someone says, do you know, you can't do that. And if I think to myself, well, it's not hurting other people. And wh why can't I do that? It's not just being told you've got to do that for the sake of doing that. You know, it's, well, we've done it always this way. I don't know if you've heard this analogy um, where someone is watching their mother bake a roast and she cuts off the two ends of the roast and puts it in the, the baking tin and the child says well why do you do that she says well I don't really know my mother did it and, and my you know her, her mother before that did it I must ask so when she went to her you know the grandmother and said why do you cut off the um the the both ends of of the roast she said well I learned that from my mother and the reason she did that was because her baking tin was too small and she needed to cut the ends off. I don't know. Have you heard that analogy? And no, so that I, had I kind totally, of been passed that. I'm yeah. sure we all have. But that's kind of, why do we do it this way? We can change things. We can make it better and improve, improve it. And I think, I don't know whether that is something that's learned or something that is built inside you. Like back in the day, and I mentioned when I was a child, I needed to uh, fund my horse. And I thought, well, what are the ways, what's available for me now? Well, my horse poos, that's manure. People need manure for their garden. What if I bag that up and, and sell it in the, you know, the side of the road? And so, yeah, it was just, it's just, I don't know, maybe it was just inbuilt. Maybe it was just something that I was created to be able to do. But um, yes, I, I, you look at challenges. There's, there's always a way. There is always a way to solve a problem. No, um, I, and if I you don't know the answer, go and find someone who is. Search it. Search for the answer till you find something that can improve. You know, improve uh, the situation. Because I bet you that if you're struggling with something and you've over been able to overcome it, there are other people who are struggling with a similar issue, and they would be very grateful to learn how you did that as well. And I love your mindset around challenges because that's exactly what we need to like uh, improve and self-improve and succeed in whatever we want. You know, we're always going to have challenges in life, but if you're excited about it versus fearful of it, like, and you have the mindset around it, it just changes everything, you know, because now you see, you see life as like, it's like a kind of like a fight or flight thing before you're fearful. You're like most people that are fearful of it. It's like a flight response, but if you have like a excitement or a fight response, like it actually changes everything. Like you, it's yeah. all about perception, but knowing how to go about life and it plays a big role, not only in your personal life, but also in business, you know, mm -hmm. because in business, you're going to have a lot of challenges. Oh, and absolutely. And being mindful, what you just said there is just so, so important, especially for where we are in the world today. You know, imagine that you in a business have a set of people who are your advisors and they are telling you something that in your heart, you know, intuitively you think, well, there's got to be a way. Don't limit yourself to uh, the people around you that think, well, this, this is the only way that we can do it. Go outside and ask other people. Oh, here's what I tend to do. And this might sound really quite bizarre. Anytime I hear anything that anyone says, I, I will tell take it with a grain of salt. It's like on Amazon, you know, when you're doing research and you're trying to find out what have people said about this particular product or whatever it is. I don't look at all of the five star. I look at the one star and the two stars and I discern my way through that. What What is the worst that someone has said? And I will often base my, my, um, my decision making on what what other people are saying. I don't go face value, you know, on the news as entrepreneurs and we, we don't do, we cert, we go out and we, we gather information and then from there we make the best, best decision. And I, I do that with my life as well. And often 
there is what I call the BS meter that goes off. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes we're born <laughs> with that. In 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 um you know being a Christian, we we call that the Holy yes, Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit that. has a gift that's called discernment, which is really, if I can use the term, the BS, the bullshit. I don't hope. <laughs> sorry. Yes, Excuse me. I, I, yes. But it is, and it's kind of we may not know what's going on, but we know in our in our spirit that that is BS. I just don't believe you. And so we'll go and search out the evidence, not to believe, to prove that our belief is true, but to come to a, a realisation that, hang on a minute, no, there's just something that's not right about that. And I think we need to be so careful about the decisions that that we make and the who we allow to speak over us, you know, and, and what we believe and what we do. So, yeah. But so, uh, and uh, uh, I could I could ask you all so many different questions around all this mindset, but obviously the hour is coming to a close. And uh, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I know you, you're the CEO and founder of Ambitious Entrepreneur Podcast Network. So, can you tell me the audience a little bit more about that and the premise of how you started that? Yes. Well, when I uh, had Career Success Radio, as I mentioned, we did that for two years. I then started, um, I continued podcasting. So even though that podcast came to an end, I'd had a number of different podcasts and they are still running today. And then I realized that I I could put my web, you know, my podcast on my own website, but I had a vision of creating um, more of a, a network where I could put all of my podcasts and then others could come and listen to, to that and, and, and have conversations around that. And so that's why I decided to start up the Ambitious Entrepreneur Podcast Network. And so what that has grown into then is alliance partners that I've hosted and produced podcasts for. I've had clients who've also had their podcasts that have been published on that network as well. But it was a very um, specific niched podcast network in the area of business. Now, being in mind that when I established that back in 2011, there weren't that many podcasts around. And the reason I decided to, to, to create that too was on the back of having gone through 12 months of being with another podcast podcast network and getting some mentoring from people who had come from the radio main, mainstream and learning as much as I could for them. And they had a podcast network with all sorts of different topics from uh, astronomy to business to lifestyle to health and wealth and all of that in between. And then I realized when they accidentally <laughs> published an episode that wasn't mine on, I think it was UFOs on my business podcast. And I quickly told them, hey, I think you've published this on the wrong, you know, on, on the, the wrong podcast. I don't talk about you and those funny. back in 2011. <laughs> I realized not only that my listeners would think, what on earth is she doing publishing, you know, about UFOs, but that there was such a mixture of um, different topics that my ideal client um, was not going to be just there on that particular network. And I thought really what they need to do is do a dedicated business network, podcast network, dedicated for this, dedicated for that. And that's why I decided, you know, I, when I do my own and now publishing my own and producing my own, I'm going to start the podcast network. And so that was on the back of someone accidentally publishing a UFO podcast episode, which was not mine uh, when I was hosted with with uh, another podcast network. But I've continued with that podcast network and it really is a place where, you know, business and leadership and all of the episodes that we've had. And there are obviously, as you can imagine, thousands of episodes on that podcast network that have been built over the years. That is awesome, and and I found I found that thing really funny about the UFO <laughs> on a business podcast. That is that is so funny, <laughs> but but uh, no, it's 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 awesome. And um and and I wanted to also ask you about this book that you wrote. Right, uh, you're the author of like industry thought leader from invisible to influential with a podcast. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and just like the general summary of it? Yes. So within that uh, book are the 
different steps that I realized were in place that enabled me to generate those two four-figure clients from a podcast, uh, those three episodes. So all of the things that I've learned through the years, I've implemented that. But particularly, uh, it's not really focusing on, on technology. Because one of the things that I say is, look, uh, we often, there's two questions that I'm often asked, where do I start? You know, where do I start with launching my podcast? And the second question often is, uh, what technology, what microphone should I get? And what I often will say to people is this, or, or ask them, what's the reason that you want to start a podcast? And often if it is, well, my current message isn't working and I've heard that a podcast will help me amplify my message, that often is a a, 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 a bell, red bell for me, you know, um, a, a red warning sign. And that this is what I will often say to people. If you're starting a podcast because your current message isn't working, yes, your podcast will amplify your message, but it's going to amplify a message that's not working to more people. So let's focus on your message. And that's what this book really focuses on, helping people identify identify what's unique, uncopyable and unforgettable about them as when they're really positioning themselves as industry thought leaders. And when I talk about thought leadership, I'm not talking about the fact that you're better than everybody else in your industry. You are better placed to help and support your ideal client because the journey you've gone through and, and the challenges you've overcome, your qualifications, the, the things that you have learned in the trenches is exactly what your ideal ideal client needs. And it is putting together that message and, and the strategy that will help them start to nurture listeners into leads from their very first episode. And that's what the book really focuses on, all of the things that uh, I had in place. And that was one of the key reasons I wrote that book. I thought, I want to develop a program and to help me develop a program, I need to get everything out of my head into a systematic structure that I can teach, that others can then take hold of and implement for themselves so that when they launch a podcast, not only is it influencing and impacting the world and their ideal client, but it's also generating income as well for their business. And that's really what the, that book focuses on. And I would definitely recommend anybody that's listening to this that wants to start a podcast themselves to definitely take a look at that book because that is that is that is very informative. And and how can our audience connect with you and get to know more about you and your work and everything that you do? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for asking. So if people are interested in podcasting and, and launching their podcast, or maybe they have got a podcast and it's not really generating the results, then podcastingwithpurpose.com is the best uh, place for them to start. If you want to just hang out and find out a little bit more about me, my personal website is annemariecross.com. And if people are looking at really building that unique and uncopyable message and really positioning themselves as an influential trusted authority, the choice versus just a choice when their client is ready to move forward. Our training academy is industrythoughtleaderacademy.com. We've got lots of different programs um, from that website that people can, can check out. That is awesome, Anne. And uh, Anne, I'm so grateful that you took the time to come and uh, and do this podcast and share your wisdom and knowledge, especially about setbacks and overcoming challenges and all of that. Because we we can uh, always do that in our own lives. You know, like all of us, uh, everybody in the audience included, has so many challenges in their lives, and it's all about how we perceive the challenge and then how we overcome it. You know, and I'm really grateful, and I do hope that you take the time to come back to the show at a later time. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. And and I want to conclude this episode by letting my fellow extraordinary Americans know that, hey, look, there's an extraordinary within each and every one of us. It's our duty to awaken it and unleash it. Until next time, bye for now. Hey, everyone. Thank you for watching Extraordinary America. If you like what you see, please do subscribe to our podcast and share it with others. Remember that the best investment that you can make in your lifetime is in your own financial education, for it is knowledge that truly sets us free. Also remember that inflation is diluting your purchasing power, which in turn increases financial bondage. The practical thing to do is to protect the loss of your purchasing power and invest in precious metals or the right cryptocurrencies. Lastly, never forget that you are an extraordinary American. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.